<laughs> All right. If you could turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 21. And we're going to read just the last verse of Judges 21, and then we'll go into the book of Ruth. And we'll read the first six verses of Ruth, chapter 1. So Judges 21, verse 25, a familiar refrain that we've got used to as we've gone through the book of Judges together. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And now the book of Ruth, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Marlon and Kilian, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. And Marlon and Kilian died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab, how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. I want to begin just by giving you an outline of the chapter, and then we'll uh, proceed with our introduction. But it, it's all really connected with movement concerning Bethlehem. And so in verses one through five, there's a movement from Bethlehem. This family leave Bethlehem, Judah, and they go from there into the land of Moab. So the first five verses, and as kind of a subtitle you might want to put here is simply this. It was a costly departure. This was a very costly move. It was going to cost them dearly uh, to leave the land of promise and to go into uh, the, uh, the country of Moab. And then verse six through 18, there's a movement to Bethlehem as a return, uh, but not the same group that left are returning. Uh, a movement to Bethlehem, and again, it's a costly decision, uh, That particularly for Ruth. She is going to make a costly decision, but also for Naomi, a costly decision to go back. And then from verse 19 to the end of the chapter, there's a movement in Bethlehem. And I want you to notice just in verse 19, it says, so they went, uh, the two went till they came to Bethlehem and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that, that all the city was moved. <laughs> so there's a movement in Bethlehem and we're going to find that Naomi is going to tell the story of her costly discipline, that she'd been disciplined by the Lord. And it was indeed a costly experience. So that's kind of the outline we're going to be working through. But just to, to begin with, by way of introduction, uh, there are two books, as we know, in our Old Testament, uh, where you have a, uh, a devoted, really, the entire books devoted to women. One is Ruth, one is Esther. The book of Ruth tells the story of a Gentile who married a Jew and became an ancestress of the Messiah, amazingly. That uh, became in uh, part of the, the line of the Messiah. And the book of Esther introduces us to a Jewess who married a Gentile and was used of God to save the Jewish nation from destruction and also to preserve the possibility of the coming of Messiah. And so very, very interesting comparison between these two books. The story of Ruth begins with a famine and ends on a very happy note, with the birth of a baby, whereas the story of Esther begins with a feast, 
and ends with the death of over 75,000 people. <laughs> so again, quite a contrast between the two books. God is mentioned 25 times in the book of Ruth, but he's never mentioned once in the book of Esther. And yet in both books, it's very evident that the providence of God is at work. Uh, in Esther, behind the scenes, uh, in the book of Ruth, very clearly seen uh, on the text of scripture. Ruth's name is only mentioned once in the New Testament, but it's a delightful mention. And it's in Matthew chapter one. We might just turn there for a second. Matthew's gospel chapter one, where we have the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Messiah of Israel. And Matthew one, verse five, it simply says this, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth and Obed begat Jesse. And of course, Jesse begat David the king. And so it's, uh, again, the highlights to us. I think we've talked about this before, but uh, this genealogy is a marvelous genealogy of grace. Uh, you've got Rahab the harlot. You've got Ruth the Moabitess. Uh, you've got the, the adulteress uh, in there as well. Uh, you have Tamar. Uh, you, you, you have uh, <clears throat> Bathsheba. And so it really is a genealogy of grace. But particularly uh, this Moabitess, Ruth, is mentioned in this genealogy. And that's the only time she's mentioned in the entire New Testament. The book of Ruth has been called a supplement to Judges and an introduction to 1 Samuel. <laughs> and so it really is a key book, uh, a kind of bridging uh, the gap in a sense between Samuel, which is really uh, the Hebrew Bible calls it the first book of Kings. So it's, it's taking us from the anarchy of judges to the monarchy uh, in the period of the Kings. And Ruth bridges that gap very, very beautifully. It was being said that coming from the book of Judges into the book of Ruth, and we've just come through, we've just studied the book of Judges. It's like coming out of a noisy, bustling marketplace into a quiet meadow. It's just a delightful contrast, a delightful change, really. After reading particularly Judges 17 through 21, where we have uh, just been in recent weeks, uh, Graham Scroggy uh, said this, Ruth is like a lovely lily in a stagnant pool. Here, instead of unfaithfulness, is loyalty. In, instead of immorality, is purity. Instead of battlefields, there are harvest fields. Instead of the warrior's shout, is the harvester's song. And so it's de it definitely comes as a welcome change from those last chapters that we went through in the book of Judges. It's like a summer morning after a night of wild tempest. <clears throat> so very appropriate, very delightful passage. Ruth was read by the Jews, particularly on the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, they had certain readings that went along with their their various festivals and so this was read at pentecost and uh, you can understand why uh, because there's a lot in the book of ruth about harvesting and of course these festivals primarily were harvest festivals and the feast of pentecost was the wheat harvest and so you can see how appropriate it would be reading ruth uh, in that kind of a background where she's gleaning in the fields and so that's how the jews would use it the the short uh, genealogy uh, at the end of the book gives us an idea of when in the period of Judges this book was written, uh, because it tells us, if you read from verse 18 of chapter 4, it says, now these are the generations of Phares. Phares begat Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, Ram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Now, Salmon is the, the man that married Rahab the harlot. And so we, we, we know we can place this in the very early period of, 
of the book of Judges uh, because Boaz is the, the offspring of Salmon and Rahab. And so it, it really is in the early parts of Judges. And I believe parallels with chapter 17 through 21. Remember, we said that those chapters were not chronological. Uh, it's actually taken us back to the, the very beginning days of the book of Judges. And so this, this is the setting as well. And so it puts together these horrible stories in chapters 17 through 21 with this delightful story uh, all appearing to occur at the same time. And it's interesting that all three of them are connected with Bethlehem Judah. There are three incidents that are connected with Bethlehem Judah. Just to remind ourselves, look back to Judges 17 and verse 7 and 8. Judges 17, 7 and 8. There was a young man out of Bethlehem Judah of the family of Judah who was a Levite, and he journeyed there, and the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem Judah to sojourn where he could find a place, and he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Mike as he journeyed. And so there's a, a, a guy who's leaving Bethlehem Judah. He's leaving Bethlehem Judah. Uh, he goes into the mountains of Ephraim. Uh, he finds Micah. And it's a story of idolatry. Uh, now, if you look at chapter 19, again, we're going to see Bethlehem Judah and journeyings to and from Bethlehem Judah again are figuring in this story. And so chapter 19, verse 1 and 2 of Judges, it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah, and his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him to her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there for whole months, and her husband arose and went after her. So here's somebody going to Bethlehem, Judah, and now we get to the book of Ruth. And once again, Bethlehem Judah is mentioned in the first verse, and it's a man who's leaving Bethlehem Judah. So these, all these stories are connected with people either going or coming from Bethlehem Judah. And of course, <clears throat> this little place would have great significance in the word of God. It's called Bethlehem, as we know, which means the house of bread. And <clears throat> it was a place uh, where the very bread of life, the true bread that came down from heaven would be born. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 tells it, even though it's little amongst the thousands of Judah, that's the place uh, where Messiah would be born. And of course, Bethlehem Judah, Bethlehem is the house of bread, and Judah is praise. Certainly, the stories in the book of Judges, and even the account here in Ruth, there's not a lot of praise connected with Bethlehem Judah. There's a famine connected with Bethlehem Judah here, the house of bread in Ruth. But when we get to the, the birth of the true bread that comes down from heaven, truly it is then Bethlehem Judah. It's linked with praise because if you look at Luke's gospel chapter two concerning the birth of the Lord Jesus, one that we're very familiar with, but verse 13 of Luke chapter 2, it says, Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And so Bethlehem and Judah fit together very beautifully in Luke's gospel chapter 2. It, the house of bread is definitely connected with praise, that day when the true bread comes down from heaven and is born in Bethlehem. And the result is great praise is brought out uh, on that occasion. So now as we get to the text in Ruth, we want to think about this movement from Bethlehem. And we said it was a costly departure in which a family makes a very bad decision. They exchange a famine for three funerals, and it's a very costly decision that they make. So it says in verse one, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. This phrase, it came to pass, it's a familiar one. It occurs 
over 400 times in the Old Testament, and it came to pass. And Jewish scholars will tell us that uh, in the Midrash, particularly, they'll say that almost in every passage where it occurs, there's a sad story or some misfortune connected with the phrase, and it came to pass. While it may not be true in every case, it certainly in the vast majority of cases where you see that phrase and it came to pass there's usually something negative occurring there's usually some sadness and certainly that's the case in this incidence he said it came to pass when the judges ruled it's interesting that the word for judge and the word ruled here are actually from the same root word and so it could be it came to pass when the judges judged uh, because it's really the same idea, the judge is judged. This is the time frame that is going on. And so during that time when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And so this famine in the land. Now, you might ask them, well, well what time frame? We said that it's obviously early on in, in judges, but the only account we have during the judges period where it seems that there's food shortages is during the time of Gideon. And if you look back to Judges 6, just for a second, and verses 3 through 6, you'll see that, that food was certainly scarce. And partly it was because of the invasion of the Midianites. And so it says in Judges 6 and verse 3, it was, and so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the East, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass, for they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And so certainly uh, we could possibly place it at the time of Gideon. Uh, that certainly would be a strong suggestion. We can't be dogmatic, but certainly there's a famine. And this famine has even affected the house of bread, Bethlehem, Judah. Because it tells us there's a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. What we do know about famines in Israel, because remember, when they went into this land, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. This is a land of abundance. Remember when they went in and they brought the grapes from, from Eshgol, and it took two men to carry a bunch of grapes. They were so heavy and so... Uh, so this was a land that was a fruitful land, uh, this land of milk and honey. And yet now, in the, in the very place called the House of Bread, there seems to be a famine that's affected uh, the land of Israel and especially Bethlehem Judah. So what would be the cause of such a famine in such a fruitful land? Well, the word of God tells us when Israel were in disobedience to the Lord, that one of the consequences would be that there would be famine amongst them. And if you look at Deuteronomy 11 and verse 13 through 17, we'll look at a couple of passages in Deuteronomy, which will give us the explanation why this was the case. It says, in Deuteronomy 11, verse 13, it shall come to pass if you shall hearken diligently to my commandments, which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I'll give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, and that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, and I'll send grass in the, thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, and there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit, and lest ye perish quickly from off the land, the good land, which the Lord giveth you. And so basically, when they turned their hearts away from God, one of the disciplinary measures that God would use would be sending famine to the land. 
Deuteronomy and chapter 28. Again, we get the same idea, verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. So part of the curses that will be pronounced would be a curse on the land uh, because of their disobedience to God. And of course, we know that in the book of Judges, that's exactly what's going on. There's idolatry, there's immorality, there's, there's departure on every side. And because of that, God indeed brings famine. He's faithful to do what he says in his words. So he brings a famine to the land and especially to Bethlehem of, of Judah. And of course, we would say, we said Judah means praise. And I'm sure that in those famine times, there wasn't a lot of praise going on with the inhabitants of Bethlehem, Judah. Think about it. This is the day when the judges ruled. There's anarchy in the land. There's famine in the house of bread. And against this dark background, this little book of Ruth shines like a precious gem. Sometimes, by way of application, we experience famine conditions in the house of God. The times when it seems like there's just a dullness, the Lord's Supper doesn't seem to have the the vibrancy, the energy that it ought to have of hearts overflowing with worship. It almost seems like a going through the motion. Sometimes the prayer meetings seem to lack vigor and life, and it just seems like the, the house of God is in a famine condition. And, and what do we do when the house of God in, is in a famine condition? Because every assembly should be a place where the saints are nourished and fed with the word of life, where the flock is fed, where sheep safely graze. But sometimes it seems that there's famine in the house of God. Do we do what Elimelech, Elimelech did? What did he do? Well, he, he bailed out. He, he left the house of bread in a time of famine. Rather than seeking God uh, in repentance, rather than crying out to God to change the scene, he just literally leaves. And many do that. Many leave assembly life when it's going through a famine time, looking for something more exciting somewhere else. And yet there are consequences. There are always consequences from departing from God's revealed truth, uh, from, from the, the truth revealed uh, from the risen, glorious head of the church. And, and sometimes when we, we leave, it might have some short-term benefit, but there are long-term consequences. And instead of seeking God for him to, to, to change the conditions, to, to bring life again, to visit the house of God again. And it's interesting, we don't read of too many people leaving Bethlehem as refugees. It's just this one family that we read about. And it's really interesting because their relative, Boaz, he stayed. He st Even though he was in Bethlehem, which at a time of famine, he, he stayed. And the next, when we see him, we see that he prospered. He actually prospered even during this time. And the Lord was with him. And so certainly it's a challenge to us because we've all, you know, assembly life has cycles. It really does. And sometimes there's cycles and it's so evident that the Lord is visiting his people. Times of blessing in the gospel, times when the meetings are just full of life and vibrancy. And, and it's just a time of visitation. Oh, for those days are so wonderful. But there's a time when it seems like a famine. What do we do? Are we going to take the Elimelech route? 
Are we going to just leave and go somewhere else that looks, well, you know, they'll just say the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And of course, where he's going to go is Moab, a, a place filled with idolatry, filled with falsehood. And so, again, we need to be careful in our own hearts that we, we stay loyal to what God has revealed in his word, even during famine times. And we seek him in repentance, Lord, maybe this is a, this is a divine judgment because we, we, we haven't loved you with all our hearts, minds, and soul and strength like we should. Maybe we need to cry out in repentance and then the Lord will visit us again in freshness and power. But certainly bailing out is not the answer. And so it tells us that this certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, we you get the names given to us here in verse 2. The name was Elimelech. And Elimelech means my God is king. But he certainly failed to live up to his name. Like the children of Israel, it seems that he was acting just like them. In the days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so Elimelech, instead of submitting to his God as king and staying in the land of promise that had been so graciously given to them and seeking repentance and seeking uh, for the Lord to visit again, he leaves. And of course, this is a story of headship because He's the head of the house. And so when he leaves, of course, Naomi has no option but to be in submission to her husband. So she follows. And along with the two children, they follow too. And there are consequences for the entire family as a result of Elimelech's de decision. Naomi, her name means pleasant or sweet. And later on, she's going to say, don't call me sweet, call me bitter uh, because of the Lord's dealings with her but Naomi, pleasant or sweet. And then what unusual names to call your boys, Marlon and Killian. Marlon means sickly. And Killian means pining. And so the idea is weakness. Now, we'll, we'll think more about the naming of these boys in a moment, but it's just interesting to, why would anybody call their children sickly and pining? <laughs> so they made a journey to leave Bethlehem. It was a 50 mile or 80 kilometer journey. It would take them, uh, even though where they were, they could, they could see from Bethlehem, the hills of Moab, uh, but the journey would be difficult. It would be hard enough to go on foot across the Judean hills over the River Jordan, uh, at the north end of the Dead Sea, and into the land of Moab. It's a kind of a sad thing, isn't it? Because the ancestors of Elimelech would have made that same journey, not going into the land of Moab, but coming into the promised land. And he's really going backwards. This is a backward move. He's going out of the land of promise that the, the Joshua and, and that generation had come in, to, in to, to enjoy the inheritance and fight for the inheritance God had given them. And this man is abandoning the inheritance. And it's almost like he's going back to the old life. He's going back to Moab. And you know, it's interesting, isn't it? There uh, when it comes to assembly truth, there, there, there's, there are generations that have gone before us and they have fought for these truths. They've taken a stand for these truths and, and they try to pass on to us a goodly inheritance. And it's a tragic thing when things are difficult in assembly life and we abandon that inheritance and go after some or the system that our brethren came out of at great price in the past. And we go back into those very systems. And it's, it's never a good move. And so this is exactly what happens. They take the very same route <laughs> that their ancestors would have taken, but in a reverse. In, it's a backward decision, a momentous decision, a sad decision, a wrong decision to abandon Emmanuel's land because of a famine. Now, if he'd have just thought about it, 
and thought about the history of the patriarchs, he would have he would have a great warning. Do you remember when the patriarchs abandoned the land during times of famine? How did it work for them? Well, we could say, for instance, when Abraham went into Egypt. Do you remember that? Because there was a famine in the land. And while he was there, he picked up a maid girl called Hagar. That was going to have consequences for his descendants to this very hour. Amazing. Lot, he took with him, and he, he got a liking for the well-watered plains of Egypt. And it would result in him choosing to dwell towards Sodom. And so what we could say is that it's never usually been a good experience that during famine conditions, when either the patriarchs or here Elimelech left the land of promise, the land of inheritance, and went seeking sustenance elsewhere. And, and we say that, that Boaz stayed in the land and not only remained wealthy, but seemed to prosper. So their problems were closely, uh, well, it wasn't a wise decision because they, although the Moabites were close relatives, and we know they were, uh, they were descendants of Lot through his incestuous relationship with his daughters. And although they began with a, with a similar ancestral faith, uh, we, we know that Lot is righteous Lot, but his descendants did not follow in his footstep. And so we find that the Moabites, the very place he takes his family to, the Moabites now were linked with false deities, with Baal and also with Chemosh the abomination of Moab. And so let's just look at a couple of references to see what the character of the Moabites was like, this land where he chose to take his family. What were they like? Look at the book of Numbers, please. Chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. And verse 29. Numbers 21 and verse 29. Woe to thee, Moab, thou art undone. O people of Chemosh, he hath given his sons that escaped and his daughters into captivity to Sion, king of the Amorites. So, so Moab, directly connected with the worship of Chemosh, this false deity uh, that they worship. But look at Jeremiah now for a second, and we get kind of more insight into the character of the Moabites. And it's kind of an interesting chapter uh, Jeremiah 48, just read recently through the book of Jeremiah, and uh, it was very interesting to observe uh, the, uh, the way the Lord describes the Moabites, and it's not complimentary by any means. Verse 11, he says, Moab hath been at ease from his youth, and he hath settled on his lees, and hath not been emptied from vessel to vessel, neither hath he gone into captivity, therefore his taste remained in him, and his scent is not changed. And so we just get the idea that they're, they have a laziness about them, a bit like the Cretans, lazy gluttons, they're, they, 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 they like the life of ease, and maybe there's an attraction there, maybe that's why Elimelech went there, because, because it's, a, it's a land of ease, it's an easier life uh, than being uh, in uh, the land of promise. And isn't it interesting that oftentimes when people leave assembly life, they go because it's an easier life to be in a mega church. You see, you just have to show up. You don't have to do anything. You know, a small assembly, every, every believer has to function. You, everybody's needed. There's, there's tremendous work. And, and go to the mega church. You can just sit there. They don't even know you're there. I remember reading of a man, he He'd been going to this church for a long time. And uh, one day he, he met the, the pastor and the pastor shook his hand and he said, oh, are you new here? He'd been there for months and months and months. The pastor didn't even know who he was. And so that was it for him. He said, I'm done. I'm out of here. They don't even know who I am. But some people like that. They like the 
the idea of being anonymous, of just being able to come in and sit down and not have to have any responsibility. And so Moab was under these. Look at verse 27 of Jaya 48. <clears throat> For was not Israel a derision unto thee? Was he found among thieves? For since thou spakest of him, thou skippest for joy. The idea is that uh, when Israel were judged by Babylon, the Moabites, they skipped for joy. In other words, they had no appreciation of the people of God. Uh, they they ridiculed them. They, they skipped for joy. Verse 29, we have heard the pride of Moab. He is exceeding proud, his loftiness and his arrogance and his pride and the haughtiness of his heart. You notice how he just piles up uh, description after description, all saying the same thing, that, that these are a people who are just oozing with pride instead of being humble. They rejoice in the downfall of the people of God. They're filled with pride and they're lazy and they're idolatrous. And that is the land that Elimelech decides to take his family to. And it says, they went to sojourn. Notice again, verse one, certain men uh, of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. And so the idea is that they didn't in intend to be there long, just to lodge for a while, just to remain only as it, as, as it seemed necessary. That's the idea. There's no intention of a permanent migration there. Uh, it was just to sojourn, just to be there a little while. But notice in verse 2, at the very end of verse 2, it says, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And so what started out as a sojourn became a continuance in fact we learned that they're going to be there for 10 years and so they they settled down there in this idolatrous land filled with ungodly influences and that's where they settled and so again it raises the question why call your children marlin and killian why would you call them uh, this idea of sickly and pining was it that their boys were born during the famine? And maybe it was an expression of the times. Uh, we, we don't know for sure. Maybe maybe it was um, that their, their names were symbolic of the condition of the children of, of, of Israel at the time, that the, the nation was in a weak and pining state. Or, or maybe the children were just born as weaklings. You know, maybe they were born that way because that would that would perhaps explain uh, the fact that they uh, they died early and they died childless. Maybe they were uh, weak and sickly at birth and they were given that name. But that's exactly what they're called, uh, sickly and pining. And so verse three, it says in Elimelech, Naomi's husband died and she was left and her two. Two, two sons notice that immediately after it says and continued there when the decision was made no longer to sojourn but to stay there immediately we read and elimelech naomi's husband died was that divine discipline that he decided to go and stay in a pagan land rather than returning to the land of promise at that point, he died. And so this story becomes a story of, of loss. There was a lost harvest in the time of famine. There was a lost husband now. And there's going to be lost heirs. Because pretty soon afterwards, we're going to read that both sons would die as well. Lost harvest, lost husband, lost heirs huge losses and yet the rest of the book we're going to see in chapter two that god is going to provide through boaz the very things that were lost there'll be a harvest in chapter two and she'll be able to enjoy that harvest there'll be a husband 
provided in chapter three for Ruth. And then there'll be an heir provided in chapter four. And how God is one sense going to restore to Naomi the years the locusts have eaten. And he's going to meet her and, as it were, bless her with these. But she has to come to a place of repentance before she can enter in to this place of blessing. And she's going to do that. We're going to see that. So I want you to just notice something interesting in the text here that I stood out to me as I was looking at it. Verse 3, it says, end of verse 3, she was left and her two sons. And then the end of verse 5, she was left of her two sons and her husband. Left and her two sons, now left of her two sons and her husband. But before these two sons die, they do something. It says in verse 4, they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orper, and the name of the other was Ruth. And again, as we've been thinking of, of names, uh, some say Orper has the idea of gazelle, and then Ruth has the idea of friendliness. So they, they marry these two uh, women from Moab, and it says they dwelt there about 10 years. Now, again, is this, is this a good thing? Well, God's going to overrule it for good, but it wasn't a good thing. The Jewish Targum, which is an interesting, the Targum is kind of like a, a loose translation of the Old Testament with commentary. And so the Targum observes that they transgress the decree of the word of the Lord and took to themselves strange women. And then it says, and because they transgressed the decree of the word of the Lord and joined affinity with strange people, therefore their days were cut off. That, that God's discipline on them, Marlon and Killian, was that they had actually taken strange wives. Now let's just, and again, remember the decision that Elimelech made, made it easy for their decision to marry strange wives. If, if he'd have stayed in the land, it would have been much more difficult for them to marry strange wives. But outside of that place where God had placed them, then, of course, it made it easier for these, these compromises to take place. And so let's just look at what the word of God has to say about marrying people who were not part of God's people, not part of the covenant people of God, Exodus 34. And we're familiar with these things, but they're, they're there in the word of God. They're very clear. They're very explicitly stated, Exodus 34 and verse 16, Exodus 34, verse 16. And and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go whoring after their gods. And so the Lord is warning them that you, you marry these pagan women, and they will take your heart away. You, you'll get involved in that kind of idolatry. And normally that's exactly what happens. Think of Solomon and his experience. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7 and verses 3 and 4. Again, just a repetition of this idea. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. But they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. And again, is that what happened to Marlon and Killian? Though it says, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people to him unto himself above all the people that are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people but you were the fewest of all people, so on and so forth. But again, we see the very same thing happening, this marriage, intermarriage, and always with a negative connotation. 
Remember Nehemiah in chapter 13, uh, being exceedingly mad at the people of God because they had married strange wives. And of course, the New Testament is very clear. We've studied it. We know it, that we're not to enter into unequal yokes. And the word of God is absolutely clear on that. And so verse 5, it says, And Marlon and Killian died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. These were sad days, especially for Naomi. Her husband and two sons had died outside of their inheritance. They had died as strangers in a strange land. Naomi was left widowed and childless. Ruth and Orpah were now young widows. And there were three vacant chairs in the house that once was a home. Three lonely widows are left to grieve. No doubt in Naomi, memories would be mingled with regret. Thoughts of what might have been if they had just stayed put, if they'd never left their homeland, if only they'd known and obeyed the principle later enshrined in the words of Psalm 37, verse 3. Psalm 37, 3 says this, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Let me read that again. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Oh, if only they had paid attention to the word of God. To be a childless widow was amongst the most lowest and most disadvantaged positions, classes in the ancient world. No one to support them. No government handout checks. No, no welfare. They were basically left to... To, to really depend on the generosity of strangers. Naomi had no family in Moab, no one else to help her. It was a very desperate, desperate situation. But then we read in verse six, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. You see, what did Moab now have to offer Naomi? A lowly, lonely, aging widow in a foreign country. It was time to return to a native Israel. Like the prodigal in the Lord's parable in Luke 15, Naomi had doubtless pondered much over her plight and remembered better days in her former home in Bethlehem. Just as the prodigal son knew that in the father's house there was bread enough to eat, she heard that the Lord had visited his people in her homeland in giving them bread. So from distant Moab, Naomi had heard that God was doing good things back in Israel. She, she had heard, as in the words of Proverbs chapter 25, let me just read it, Proverbs 25, verse 25, she had heard as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. She had heard good news that the Lord had visited his people once again. And so she wanted to be part of it. She wanted to be, she wanted to be there in the land where God had once again visited his people. Do you long for the Lord to visit his people again? Maybe some of our assemblies are going through famine times right now. Are you crying out to God for a revival, a, a, a work of the Holy Spirit, a, a divine visitation? on our assemblies that would, would reinvigorate our meeting with freshness and power and the gospel would be preached and souls would be saved and there'd, be, there'd just be this new life, this new vigor so that those that have wandered away would hear that God has visited us again and want to come back. Now, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that as, as we gave the outline, 
we, we saw that first five verses is this movement from Bethlehem. But then this lengthy section from six through 18 is to do with the journey back. It's, it's the idea of a movement to Bethlehem. And then the last two verses is that movement in Bethlehem. It, it, so more time is devoted in the text to restoration than there is to departure and then the results of restoration. That tells us something is that God is committed to the restoration of his people. Now, sometimes it's easy to depart, but it takes a bit longer to come back, <laughs> partly because um, it's a humbling experience to have to come back. And our pride militates against it. And it sometimes takes a while for us to get low enough to come back. But nevertheless, this woman, she makes a, a decision. It's a costly decision, but it's an important decision. She said, I'm going back. She's going back to the place that the Lord had blessed them with, given them an inheritance there. She wants part of it. And she'd heard that God had once again visited his people. Oh, may God he, uh, do a work amongst us so that there's a visitation once again in the house of God. And that wanderers that have gone astray, that have taken the easy route, that have bailed out, will hear that God has visited us and that they'll want to come back. And what is it that brought them back? It wasn't just the hard experience of Moab, but it was the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. It was hearing that God had visited his people. And it's always the case, isn't it? The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So may the Lord encourage us with these things. There's a lot of practical instructions in this section for all of us to ponder. But again, think long and hard before leaving the place of his inheritance, the house of God, conducted in New Testament simplicity, but sometimes going through famine conditions. Don't bail out. Seek the face of God that he'll visit us again. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.